Right. So, hey, welcome everyone to the second keynote in this 2021 Liviana conference. So this is the Community Economies Research Network online conference. This is the second time we've run this, a way for us all to connect around the globe, um, this scattered global community of scholars and activists and artists who are interested in exploring community economies and thinking about how we enact, support, um, help uh, economies that, um, that support community. Sorry, my partner is giving me a strange look across the kitchen. This is one of the issues of working at home. Um, no. Um, so we're a global community. We're spread across the world. We're connected by the Community Economies Research Network and the Community Economies Institute to back up um, the work that we're all doing. I'm very happy to have Maliha Safri here uh, to give our second keynote today and introducing her as Stephen Healy. Please keep your microphones on mute unless you're speaking. Um, feel free to add comments and questions in the chat. And as always, engage with kindness and respect in this space. So welcome everyone and over to Stephen. Thanks, Kat. Um, good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, speaking to you from Darg and Garangai lands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Malia Safri. Um, I've had a little chance to reflect a bit. We met in 1996 uh, in the Berkshire Mountains at an Association for Economic and Social Analysis retreat. Um, that's, if I do the math right, that's 25 years ago, so a quarter century of knowing Maliha. My initial impression of her was that she was a very quiet and reserved person. I then discovered that she was from Chicago, and um, that made a lot of sense to me afterwards as I realized Malia is um, a very loud and assertive um, person and a force to be reckoned with. Um, so she studied uh, with Stephen Resnick and Rick Wolf, um, two of the progenitors of the whole Amherst School of Marxian Analysis, along with Julie Graham and Malia played a pivotal role in organizing um, many of the seminars that we all took together with Yaya Madra and other colleagues um, that informed, I think, a lot of community economies theory. Um, Malia then uh, left uh, University of Massachusetts to assume a professorship at Drew University. Um, where she's worked for many years, um, having just obtained that rank recently. Congratulations, um, Malia. She's also been chair of the department for quite a number of years. Malia has been active uh, as an editorial board member uh, for Rethinking Marxism, uh, acting as an associate in other capacity uh, for quite a long time. Um, she's been actively involved in the Community Economies Collective as well most notably as part of the editorial collective of the Diverse Economies and Livable Worlds book series. So she's written extensively on the powers of cooperation, the international economic dynamics of migrant families, finance, ways of calculating and valuing economic impacts, um, and extensively on the subject of today's talk, which is the solidarity economy. But from my perspective, that's really um, half the story. I'm gonna see if I can share a slide quickly. It's a one slide show. Um, this is Maliha um, about a decade ago at one of the Occupy uh, teach-ins uh, for radical economics. That particular group went on to play um, a pivotal role in Occupy Sandy years later. Um, and a lot of the people who were involved in that particular um, group uh, became quite involved in Solidarity NYC and other efforts. So Malia has been really tirelessly committed to her, the activism half of her scholarly practice. Um, and I think the other form that that has taken is that um, Malia and I have been working on a book project with other colleagues for a few years now. And oftentimes the conversations begin and end with Malia talking about the stream of students who have come in to her office to seek her counsel and guidance. So Malia has been um, a friend to the next generation, um, shepherding them through things like the global financial crisis, um, police brutality and the struggle against it. Uh, and in the context of the present pandemic, thinking about the mental, emotional, physical, and economic impacts of that. So um, I think 
Um, Malia is someone who takes her duty of care quite seriously. She's also been really involved with um, co-ops co in New York for a number of years uh, in both a scholarly and an activist capacity. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Malia has to say. So over to you, please. Thank you so much for such a beautiful and moving introduction. That's what happens when your old when your old friend introduces you. You kind of want to reduce to a puddle of tears right before you walk on the stage. Um, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I thank you for that gift. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, start also with land acknowledgements. I come to you from Lenape land um, in uh, today known as Harlem, Manhattan, New York. Um, I've had a chance to attend some of the conversations this week in Liviana, including Kevin's last week, which was really inspiring. And also in addition to that, a couple of other sessions, which I, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to today. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with people who I think can help me think and who I've turned to to help me think and who I've learned from for, for oh, more than two decades, as Stephen <laughs> pointed out. Um, so for me, I, I'm going to start a little bit with some of my early work and how that early work fed into the later work. Ooh, can you see the? Is that, is that okay now? Okay, I'm gonna move it like that, hopefully, like that. Okay, so um, the uh, it all kind of began, or at least one significant part of my work began with this participatory action research project that I helped organize in Asbury Park, 2008 to 2011. Um, in a church basement, that's what you see on the bottom. And uh, the the uh, top photo was taken from the New York Times. Uh, Asbury Park is a bit of a working class community in New Jersey with high poverty, always expected and planned for major gentrification to occur there since it's not so far from New York City, but it never quite happened. And so that top uh, 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 photograph is an example of, of those big projects that didn't quite um, ever take off. And uh, in those, er, in, in those, uh, in that church basement, sorry, I guess I'm trying to advance the slide there. Um, we did uh, in, uh, we did a little bit of the work that once, um, how, how Ethan had described, Ethan Miller had described the, the polyvalent term of community economies, um, which condenses three distinct yet interrelated moments. In the first moment, CE1, it's called the ontological moment. That's almost an example of what you see here. This was a slide that I used because part of our class was, half the class was composed of ex-prisoners and the other half were undocumented Spanish speaking um, immigrants. Um, the, the, so, the CE1 is the ontological moment. CE2 is the moment of ethical exposure, the affirmation of a demand to render visible and contestable the dynamics and consequences and thus responsibilities of our interrelationships. There's a third moment too, but I'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, in this deontologizing moment in, the, in those workshops, we really had a lot of conversations by concentrating on two elements in this uh, diverse economy. Um, it's not, it's a version of the, of the iceberg. Um, we concentrated on theft and feudalism and slavery uh, as they played out in the lives of those who were uh, both formerly imprisoned and as later the undocumented immigrants joined. And they discussed concrete examples of what they thought of as slavery or super exploitation, ex exploitation due to discrimination. For instance, three of the guys, th those three guys that you saw in the beginning in the, in the second slide uh, reported being required to work in prison and receiving zero wages. The wage theft was definitely reported by every single one of the undocumented immigrants, which is a common occurrence here, uh, und undocumented immigrants 
uh, are often told at the end of the week or perhaps sometimes the month that their employer will not pay them because their employer is taking a gamble that they will not actually pursue their legal rights to be paid their wages irrespective of their uh, documentation status. So as part of the participatory action research group, our group interviewed another group uh, in town re called Redeem Her, a group that had three collectively run thrift stores and an affordable housing cooperative run and managed by ex-prisoner women, most of whom were women of color. And uh, young men ended up seeing what their elders described, women who described trying to have a period with dignity in prison because a single tampon cost $8 back in 2008. Um, so one of the things that Redeem Her would do was create care packages of uh, basic necessities like uh, tampons and toothpaste for women still in prison. Um, this is an example of secondary exploitation as uh, Kostas Lapovitsas described. Uh, he described Okay, extraction happens not only at the point of production, but also extraction occurs in the many ways that people need to pay more for shelter, medical care, basic life necessities. And here we could probably distinguish, and we did distinguish in these workshops, the um, difference between the abnormal rates of extraction for those that are imprisoned or undocumented and racialized as well. But then obviously there was a way that discrimination continued even after exiting prison and remained a, a continuous part of life. One woman, one woman from the group, Redeem Her, described the continuous assault of discrimination that finally made her realize, and this is quote what she said, fuck it, they won't give us jobs, we'll make our own. And this is how their first collective thrift store and affordable housing cooperative began. Um, I think what we could start to see right there uh, is a certain kind of, let's say mobilization of both uh, post-capitalist and anti-capitalist politics. Uh, that group in Asbury Park began the first worker cooperative uh, in New Jersey. Uh, it was hard birthing someone that cannot something that cannot be recognized by the state apparatus as a, as a distinct type of firm. And for the next few years, I did more and more work in New York City with undocumented immigrants who were leading the way when it came to forming and sustaining worker cooperatives. They were the majority. Um, their daily construction of something new was motivated by their rejection of the wage theft and exploitation they experienced. And that, that's constant uh, in the name of the worker cooperative itself. You could see a kind of assertion. Oscar, who's the guy in the orange was very vocal about this name because he had said he had been tired of being told he wasn't American when his employers tried to steal his wages after he had finished working for, in America. And of course he never, uh, he always reminded us that he's from Mexico, which is in Central and North America, which is, means he's also an American too. So uh, even though I'm very allergic to anything that was, you know, a little bit patriotic, but I understood what the point was. Um, and we did, all, so this group, plus the enlarged group of all of the uh, community researchers did interviews with people in this town. And uh, these groups that we mapped here it turned out to be the first customers for the worker cooperative. Um, and then around this time, I published a couple of pieces, a chapter, including in, in the book collection that uh, Gibson Graham edited, Diverse Economies. And I, you could say that I began to be interested in this project of building non-capitalist supply chains. And this became a running thread for me. How could we think about a network of community economy projects, practices, that are intentionally articulated in economic relations together. And I was not the only one on this track by a long shot, obviously. There were many others. 
um, who were working on this in other countries, in my city, in other cities. Uh, I got to know the work of Craig Borowiak and he became a good friend and also colleague and comrade. And uh, an activist group in New York City did the same kind of map using Google Maps. That's the one that you can see in the middle. And then you can start to see other people were using Google Earth, really the most, the simplest of technologies. Um, and there were a lot of peace, uh, um, Solidarity and Green Economy Alliance in Worcester did this also using Google Earth. Groups started contacting me from San Francisco, Austin, Texas, Baltimore, a lot of cities. There were a lot of cities that were doing this kind of work around that time. And from here, I jump to a different we, uh, because another team project began at this time. I started working with Stephen Healy, Craig Borowiak, and Mariana Pavlovskaya. We applied for a National Science Foundation grant in partnership with Julie Matai and Emily Kuano, both of whom were part of the US Solidarity ne Economy Network. And one of the outcomes of that big project was this, the US version of some of those national maps that I just showed you. Um, now, this was the first US national map of its kind. Um, now, since then, there have been a few others. New Economy Institute, for instance, has also come up with one. The map was always supposed to facilitate connections. If you wanted to search for a particular good or service, there was a function built to allow people to search for that. It was also supposed to facilitate research um, by allowing people to openly access databases that we had. Um, and you would also be allowed to search for specific types of organizations in your specific city. Uh, and right away, I will say that this kind of work dramatically shaped what kinds of practices that we studied and included on such a formalized map drawing together many different constituencies and their desires as well. And overwhelmingly, we concentrated on formal rather than informal practices, not because we thought one was more valuable, absolutely not. If anything, we could see the symbiotic ways that informal and formal solidarity economies exist. Um, but we kept on with a method because we were excited about what that method could allow us to do. And it was allowing us to do much more careful work at the city level than even the national level, to be honest. The I mean, we spent much, much more time here than we even did at that national level, even though in some ways that national level was the impetus for the project in the beginning. Um, and we examined major types of formal post-capitalist projects. We created inventories and tried to examine the spatial dynamics that operated. And of course, we, we, we did a lot of work in three cities, but I, I'm showing uh, the, this work because this work was done in two, Philadelphia on the right-hand side and New York City on the left-hand side. Um, and um, we did, we did do, the, we did do, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me say one thing. What we wanted to do was look at these practices in aggregate, but also disaggregated. Meaning we were interested not just in all of, looking at all of these things together, but looking at them also sector by sector, type by type to see what kinds of differences. And we were kind of sure there were gonna be differences and there did turn out to be differences. So one sector that we looked at was of course, worker cooperatives. Some of you are familiar with this because I worked on this paper for at least two years while uh, in, in conversation with CEC group. Um, one sector, we did a survey. We did a survey of all the worker cooperatives in New York City in 2016. And this major finding, this, this project, Mariana Pavlovskaya, Lauren Hudson and I worked on. And uh, this finding has actually, or this survey has yet to be done again. And it is pretty mind blowing in some ways because we could see that this sector, and I, I don't know if the screen is cutting it off, but you can see, so we, we, we wanted to see all, 
all the worker cooperatives, including one very big outlier, which is very large. It has 2000 workers, uh, cooperative home care associates. So on the left hand side, we represent it, including this big outlier. And on the right hand side, we include the, let's say, composition of workers in worker cooperatives, um, excluding this outlier, including this outlier. The workers are 70% Latina and 28% Black. Uh, and then excluding the this large outlier, the Latina percentage actually doesn't change very much. It, it remains 71%, but there is a slightly larger, let's say, showing when we exclude that large outlier and we start to see a, a little bit of a, a white um, constituency, but overwhelmingly, it's a feminine workforce, 98% women, 99% non-white. And they are working in caring labor, uh, service occupations, many, most of them, right? Elder care, child care, cleaning. Um, so we, we, we can see that there is a, th this was important. And and a lot of the Latina women are leaders of what they understand as not just a, a way of working, but a social movement. Um, and they are always building into their work the agitation for the rights of the undocumented. For instance, uh, Latin, mo mostly un undocumented workers were excluded from federal stimulus checks uh, in COVID relief packages. And so as part of the work that is part of the work of being members of the worker cooperative, they also agitated to get city level income and food support during the pandemic as part of a coalition. They were successful in doing that as well, right? Um, and so it's not the, but it's not the, this is not the only sector where we honestly saw a mutual constitu, constitu a mutual constitute a mutual constitution between opposing particular racialized policies and the maintenance of the post capitalist project itself. So we wanted to take a look at some major sectors. Um, I, and I'm just gonna show you just just a little bit. No, I'm not trying to be comprehensive. There's a lot of different pieces to this project. Um, we looked at. Uh, for instance, you can see right away housing cooperatives are a big player inside the kinds of projects that we mapped. Uh, so are community gardens. And there are very interesting things about both of those. Housing is a sector where we predominantly see a constituency, a, a, a constituency of black and brown residents. And housing cooperatives are designed to be accessible in terms of price and they have income limits as well, right? Designed to basically promote home uh, ownership for lower middle income uh, residents. Um, community gardens are also racialized in a, in a, in, in a way, 80% of the community gardens that we have in New York City are in communities of color and are being used for food growing purposes, subsistence purposes. So mapping their location spatially in the city also allowed us to see some significant clustering, right? it was definitely not even through the city. And you can see that. Um, you might almost actually say that some of the, when we, when we started to look at the clustering, we can see almost the, um, the way that they look like man-made mountains, man-made mountains of post-capitalist projects that, um, that are like bulwarks. A little bit. That, that that's I, in fact one of the spatial patterns. That's the way we name that spatial pattern. Um, you can definitely see. And by the way, I live here, and the some of the clustering that we see in South Bronx, in North Manhattan, particularly this part of Queens, um, and here we can you can definitely say that these are predominantly communities of color. And even the, the, the where we see these mountains, man-made mountains in, in, uh, in more predominantly white communities, the, the composition is primarily people of color because those, the, those communities have changed around them 
And even though wider uh, uh, residents may have moved in, that's not who's actually constituting, for instance, some of the, a lot of affordable housing cooperatives in the Lower East Side and uh, Hell's Kitchen. Sorry for that, uh, neighborhood level detail. Um, so what we wanted to see was if we take the outlines of those man-made mountains or bulwarks, you can also start to see a connection to redlining. Redlining was this process by which neighborhoods primarily composed of people of color were deemed hazardous, dangerous. In fact, I, you can barely see it, but uh, th this is the HOLC classification, the Homeowners Loan Corporation classification, D is hazardous, and the way you got a D rating for the community was if you were primarily constituted by people of color. And those communities were uh, deprived of any credit and many, important social services, including but not limited to education. Those red areas, all these red areas that you see are areas where people of color had to survive the effects of what Massey and Denton have called American apartheid. So it is not accidental that post-capitalist activities afford a kind of protection against the worst of racial capitalism. And that plays out in this map in the sense of where we see these densities rising up cropping up. Now, of course, I'm not saying that every single neighbor, that's definitely not true, right? Uh, it's not true that it's in every neighborhood of color. So I'm, I'm, I'm really not trying to make a, that universal claim at all. Um, but overall, we did definitely find that several types of organizations, housing cooperatives, worker cooperatives, community gardens, are concentrating heavily where poor Latino and black populations live. Um, and people of color are giant players in terms of formal post-capitalist projects in New York City. And there is unevenness that requires our attention and there's something to work on to improve out very clearly as well because there is a de desire, there is an expressed commitment to inclusion and equity. We saw other patterns as well, um, uh, border zones in Philadelphia. And so, and, and I'm not, I don't have time to kind of get into that, that whole other pattern. So, but I, I wanna bring that up because I wanna say that there were no, there was no such thing as one kind of way that post-capitalist projects mapped vis-a-vis -vis race or poverty. Um, and there's, we have to work out what solidarity cities look like contingently in place for sure. Um, but nonetheless, everything that we found in New York City was very interesting, at least to us. <laughs> um, and I think to other people too. Um, so we worked, we, we produced uh, five articles, we, uh, a couple of reports, but now we're working on a book. And right now I would say we are wrestling with, um, we are wrestling with how to show post-capitalist politics in practice and the ways that could, they could be considered not just uh, anti-capitalist, but opposed to particular racial capitalist practices like redlining that further segregate. And we know that for instance, redlining has also continued unofficially. Just, I mean, I know, I know that it has in my neighborhood because this, this year one bank was convicted <laughs> and, and as a result has to um, change its lending practices dramatically and offer subsidized rates because of the way they had been redlining officially in this neighborhood for 30 years. And now they've got a, but that was illegal. So that is a continuing process, right? Um, oops, sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. So uh, I wanted to um, uh, find myself, I, I wanted to think about this connection between rage and hope. And I find myself going back to some very important works for me about this. One work was, of course, and I'm sorry, this is getting cut off in the, on the top, was the article Class Enchantment by J.K. Gibson Graham. 
um, in this article, which is so formative for me in so many ways, Gibson Graham uses two movies that muster entirely different affects and reactions and audiences brassed off, ends with a dying minor, also a band leader coughing blood into his handkerchief as he gives a speech against the effects of Thatcherism and the closure of minds to a very well-heeled audience. And Full Monty, and I remember because I watched, I watched this movie twice and the second time I watched it with Julie, Full Monty ends differently with an exuberant becoming as men cast off old constraints of gender and sexuality and find their desire through a strip collective. It was a brilliant, this piece was brilliant for the ways that it identified a problem in the ways that affect could foreclose or could connect to post-capitalist politics, right? And I think that the, uh, another person that picked this up was Jaren Oselchuk in her paper, Morning Melancholy and the Politics. She picks up exactly, and th th that paper, this paper is, continues the conversation uh, from that paper. Um, and uh, in, in this paper, Jaren is looking at the privatization of state-owned paper firms in Turkey in 2006, and she connects Gibson Graham's critique to Wendy Brown's critique of politics that dwell in ressentiment or injured identity by means of installing a righteous pride in powerlessness, which then becomes complicit in the reproduction of the conditions of its exclusion, thereby rendering itself impotent. And in the process, forestalling the process of subjectification. I wanna concentrate on the, uh, on the uh, 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 last part of this quote. I, she, Jaren, does not wish to impose a stagist consequentiality between the processes of resubjectification and working through the loss, such that the former is reserved to commence only after the old working class identity is successfully and thoroughly left behind. Rather, she wants to posit the possibility of a spontaneous interdependency between resubjectification and working through the loss. So she, right, she's, um, helping us break up a stagist understanding where that there would be a loss of identity and then a becoming new that are that that where there there's a clear almost cathartic break that separates those two stages between loss injury and anger and then resubjectification right and so she Jen helped us rethink this relationship between identity politics and class transformation admitting that the effects of loss might be not only unavoidable, but potentially productive. And what are some of the politically empowering modalities for incorporating them such that they assist rather than stunt class resubjectification? And now all of these examples, Jaren's example of the state-owned paper firms, Brastoff and Full Mounty, uh, involve the more traditional working class injuries of plant closure and loss of employment, and then a potential resubjectification of those same workers as new kinds of class uh, subjects. I'm interested also in this interdependency. Oops, sorry. I'm also interested in this interdependency, but I want to um, look at uh, specifically how that intersection relates to, might relate to racial capitalist processes and post-capitalist politics. Now, loads of people are interested in anger, obviously. Very, very quick side note. I was looking at some political theorists and there is a recent collection called The Affect Effect and they are looking at how it is that affects are mobilized in political projects. Obviously, that's a something of global concern, um, but they are looking at it in the context of the US. They showed that anxiety was a little more associated with avoidance, overestimation of risks. Anger was associated with action and a greater tolerance for risky action. Now, they looked at, at basically public reactions in the wake of 9-11, uh, to show how it is that anger and anxiety mapped onto intervention and non-intervention. And, and, and I know that there is a cottage industry of political theorists trying to examine the ways that anger has mobilized the far right. So uh, anger obviously has many valences which can be used in a spectrum of political ways. But what I'm interested in is how can anger be a part of this other intersection that I'm interested in, right? Um, uh, and, and I wanna pick up what 
uh, from one speech given by um, the black poet and activist Audre Lorde, 1981. She gives the keynote address at the annual conference of the National Women's Studies Association. In her speech, later published as the essay, The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism, Lorde argued that to effectively address racial injustice, we must first acknowledge the anger that racism gives rise to, whether we're experiencing it personally or simply witnessing its effect on others and then harness that anger as a tool. Now, the philosopher Misha Cherry, 2021, uses Lord's arguments for her new book, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. Among the various types of anger that a person can have upon experiencing or witnessing injustices, she identifies one, which she calls Lordian rage after Audre Lorde, that is productive. Uh, she identifies in interviews, though, what she calls narcissistic or rogue rage. The latter she identifies in terms of white nationalist politics, especially in terms of the Capitol Hill riot. Um, now, Cherry, Misha Cherry, argues that Lordian rage is inclusive because even in that speech, Audre Lorde understands that her freedom as a black woman is bound up with the freedom of indigenous women and women of the global South. Now, recent work, um, sorry, I, I saw, apologize, but it was a long block quote, but it's so beautiful, um, I'm gonna try. So it is not, uh, th this, um, book by indigenous thinker Leanne Betsamuk Simpson picks up this idea of loss and resistance as it connects to indigenous life and post-capitalist politics. She has a beautiful chapter in this book, chapter five. She is a Nishnabeg indigenous woman from Lake Ontario region of Canada. Um, uh, so that's why it's called Nishnabeg anti-capitalism. She explains in that chapter how she first felt intimidated to talk about anti-capitalist politics when she's about to meet Naomi Klein for the first time for an interview, but then she realizes that anti-capitalist politics are inherent to indigenous resistance and life, and she says she understands the brilliance of her own people uh, in terms of their continued uh, presence. Um, she understands the glorious ways her people have thrived, not only as victims, but as active makers of a better and more ecologically reparative world. Um, sorry, uh, a way of living, uh, I, I just wanted to see the last sentence, a way of living that considered in a deep, profound way, relationality, thoroughly and profoundly empathetic. Of course, this strikes uh, many um, similarities to the uh, in axiom, ethical axiom of interdependency, of course, that has been talked about in these groups, in this group. Now, um, there are, of course, you could say historians of post-capitalist politics. Jessica Gordon Nembhard's work, W.B. Du Bois in 1907, Laville's work, forthcoming. He has a book on associationism and how it is that associationism uh, occurred in the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. And could before the naming of things, even as a particular kind of economy. Um, and of course, in from this group, the work of Caroline Shinaz Hussain, that there that the history her work, I think she's also tried to show us that the history of social economy in Canada has focused so much on formal institutions that it has overlooked the significant innovation of Black diasporic women. In her most recent article in Feminist Economics, she looks at three social enterprises for whom the commitment to entrepreneurial activities and cooperatives is rooted in their lived experience as racialized immigrant women. They bring a new lens to social enterprise development as they know firsthand what it means to be ethnic, to be an outcast, a minority, and a woman of color. In earlier work, she had tried, she had showed us the way that money pools, raskas, is specifically Caribbean indigenous banking systems such as Susu, Partner, Meeting, Turn, Box Hand, also going under many other, by many other localized names, are long-standing ancient traditions, right? 
Um, but she also wants to make a point that they are advancing politicized economic solidarity. I think that's worth uh, highlighting. Um, I think there is a tension in naming uh, social economy, solidarity economy. Uh, uh, there is a continuous tension in post-capitalist politics, which is just honestly the naming of it. There are a lot of competing signifiers, obviously, um, just some of the ones that from the traditions in which I have been sort of trained uh, in, in the Marxian economic tradition, communist e economies, uh, solidarity and social economies in this much more, let's say in terms of my work, in terms of how I'm interacting with social activist groups on the ground who are going by that signifier. And then of course, community economies and diverse economies in terms of my long work with and thinking and learning from this group. And in this group, I can really say that there is a chain of equivalence between those terms. Um, but I very much understand that is a contingent thread finely woven through different political positions and probably a thread that would be resisted by others. Cannot tell you how many times Marxist comrades have rejected my work in anything that I, in, in which I spoke of community economies um, as they just rejected it as outside the legibility of the politics that they desire. And, um, and yet, you know, there were others that accepted and supported that, but still distinguished, right, for sure. One indigenous activist collective that I pay attention, a lot of attention to in the US, Red Nation, uh, explicitly names communism as both the past and the horizon for indigenous people. And I can also see and hear from indigenous movements who reject that label as a new name for what they have always done, as, the, as is contained in the title of Leanne Betsamok Simpson's uh, book. Um, and perhaps even worse, disrespectful of the ways, the ancientness of their tradition. Um, so I, all I can say is that solidarity, I, I, I think that uh, what, what was persuasive to me was how Ethan described solidarity economies as the third moment in that polyvalent term of community economies, the moment of politics in which the inevitable posit positivity of our collective ethical negotiations is made explicit and becomes a site of connection, exclusion, struggle, and active transformation. All I can do, though, is put a pin in this problem and ask, uh, identify it and ask for your thoughts, reflections, guidance in thinking through this. Um, I'll end with, I'll end with uh, one, let's say, vision that has been important enough to guide work in many different spaces, in many different cities, um, especially all of this, in all of the cities where there are live, let's say, solidarity economy groups and movements agitating for different kinds of policies and intercooperative work and intercooperative alliances. Um, and so this is the, the sort of the, the vision behind Cooperative Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, uh, an emerging network of cooperative enterprises and supporting social solidarity institutions. Our aim is to transform Jackson's economy uh, and social order by building a vibrant social and solidarity economy anchored by worker and community owned enterprises that are grounded in sustainable practices of production, distribution, consumption and recycling. We aim to produce quality living jobs for our community, create sustainable and regenerative production systems, protect our community from the ravages of climate change and to respect, protect and fulfill the human rights and human potential of all residents of our community. And they, uh, you can see that they, oh, sorry, I really apologize for the bad quality of this reproduction, but I, could, I couldn't, this, this is straight from their book. Um, but this is part of their city. This is part of the 
plan that on which both Lumumba Sr. and Lumumba Jr., who is currently the mayor, have been elected. And so this is the basic outline for their vision of the city in which you would have, apologies again, but this reads solidarity city, fab city, sustainable city, human rights city. And they wanted to see how they, they identified solidarity city along the lines of what I just read, but fab city referred to, well, a place where you could have indigenous production and uh, knowledge and uh, innovation and sustainable city, obviously, because they could also, I mean, Jackson, Mississippi has some of the, wor the worst water quality in the state of Mississippi. Um, it has, some, it, it, it has it's, a, it's also an industrial city and also a human rights city in terms of their specific platform and policies around racial justice. And so what, what, we, what, we're, what we're toying with is how might we make, remake the city along these different kinds of visions. Um, and that's, that's how we get to the title of our book, Solidarity City, Confronting Racial Capitalism, Mapping Transformations. Um, I'll end there. And I, oh, I'm really sorry. I think I, yeah, I'll end there. Okay. Thanks very much, Malika. Fantastic, um, both in terms of the description of the book and putting it in historical context in the context of your work. So we have a little bit of time for questions, perhaps not as much time as we might like, um, but we'll see what we can do. So I can see from the chat that Kath has um, raised a question. Kath, do you want to speak to him? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, wonderful, Maliha. That was terrific to hear and really wonderful to hear that early story of where you started out with the, the groups and that and social enterprise. So I guess I was thinking, I mean, that map that you showed of the US and the interest in the non-capitalist supply chains as a way of connecting uh, the solidarity economy as the way of kind of making it much more than the dots on the map kind of thing was one of the imperatives of doing that early mapping. And I'm just wondering how that sits with the work that you've done more recently. And it's really interesting that the, the you know, what you're showing is that the, it's how, housing co-ops, uh, worker co-ops, I'm presumably mainly in the service sector in care and so on, and cleaning and I gather, um, and community gardens are the three big areas. And to what extent are there, or is it possible even to think of supply chain connections between those, sectors because it seems like I'm not, I'm not sure I'm wondering and I wonder and I know you probably I mean it would be another whole research project to think about that but what's happened with that interest in non-capitalist supply chains with the most recent work and is is that a sort of an avenue or strategy for building strength around I things? think so I think uh, definitely um I mean I'm we're missing a little bit Lauren Hudson here but she was also a, a player in solidarity NYC a lot of solidarity NYC's uh, energies have gone into a, a project called Cooperative Economic Alliance of New York and so in that they are exactly doing that the work of how do we connect for instance, housing cooperatives with community supported agriculture with credit unions. And so there are examples of, of, of that. There are individual examples that where they're trying to almost hit four different right lines of connection. And there are those, for instance, Norwood CSA in the Bronx is located in a community garden next to a housing cooperative. And then the credit local credit union started to do financial literacy outreach classes with both the community garden and residents of the housing cooperative. So there are these, I think, I, I think we are not alone, but that 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 work of knitting together is almost the a desire. I, I mean, in some ways, it's it's how to advance a little bit power, and and I can see that happening in in this city, and for sure, I gotta say, in others too. Great, thanks. Yeah. 
Other questions? We've got a few minutes. Kat, please. Thank you. I was just going to type, I was typing something in the chat and thought I'd just put up my hand. Um, so Maliha, I really appreciate the way that you um, point to the tensions of naming and the kind of really complex politics around naming. Um, I think it's a discussion that we've been having in this group for a while and it's, um, yeah, it's so complex. It feels like a kind of uh, a resurgence of a kind of identity politics almost linked in with how do you speak about the way you piece a livelihood together? How do you give a name that recognizes those strands that link things that don't, you know, that doesn't disrespect the ancient traditions that, um, that deserve attention and notice um, and don't alienate our allies in other fields of work? Um, you know, it's it's such a it's such an issue. I don't. You kind of asked us to think about it with you. <laughs> I know. I, I, I know. I, I think, I think yeah, that, and I'm not even sure. I mean, like, I think it's something we all have to almost continually navigate. I know that I was going to these meetings more recently where mutual aid was being discussed in in COVID nineteen, and and then I I'm, I I gotta say in three meetings people of color were really irritated with the naming of mutual aid because they said, this is shit we've always done and you're calling it this now. But again, this is, you know, this, when we had, when one of us was laid off, we, we would do this, we would do rent parties, we would do, you know, so, so uh, I, 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 I know that it is. I, I I can I can say that I feel tired of of also the this problem. But I I know there's no such thing as being tired of this because this is an ongoing. This is part of what it means to be doing work in place because this means that different people are going to have different understandings and different names for the work that they do. Um, I'm not quite sure though that like how how do you then go forward and say yes i understand that but then i still we're still working on this on very similar thing we're working on the same universe of practices and at some level i'm okay with not having the same name i i'm i'm okay with you having a different name and I'm okay with different names, and I'm uh, maybe maybe that's a that's maybe that's a thing. We just we just have to live with that proliferation of of identifications. It's how you facilitate a proliferation and don't and keep it right. This is the struggle: how you keep it constantly open and and avoid the closing down. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky thing. I want to give a shout out to my um, uh, friends, amazing co-thinkers, Mariana and Steven are here. Um, uh, this is like, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and Steven, when I was saying I was nervous about tonight, he said something like, well, that's okay. Just if you make any mistakes, blame them on me. And, and I was like, oh my God, that's, that's what your friend says, right? Like, like, let me, which I really appreciate. Yeah, Sarah. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much um, for this talk. It really resonates with the work that I'm trying to do for my dissertation. Um, I wanted to ask you something. I had a couple of additional questions, but I don't think we have time. Uh, but I wanted to ask you something that I'm struggling with right now, and it's around mapping things especially when uh, you work with undocumented immigrants. And so I wanted to ask you if, you if you came across that sort of ethical struggle of, yes, we have people on a map or groups on a map, right? And we also, it, it is a way to connect them, to recognize them, to value them. But at the same time, when you have them on a map, 
everyone can see where they are. And I'm speaking about, I'm speaking from a, a perspective of, a, so my work, my dissertation work is based in Boston, Massachusetts, but also in Charlotte, North Carolina. And one of the biggest issues in Charlotte is basically uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, ICE had a lot of rates outside, for example, uh, food businesses. So even placing a grocery store that is a common destination for uh, migrant communities in a map can have that sort of um, implication of being a target for all of these. And so I was wondering if you came across these problems and how you dealt with it. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot to say, and I actually will. Uh, I'm I'm happy to talk with you um, and set up another time to chat more about your work because there's a lot lot to say about that. Um, I will say that um, I don't think we we never really. Okay, so the, 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 we, we never um, put obviously home addresses on a map, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes even when there are businesses, businesses, uh, worker cooperatives are often have a PO box or um, they, they will have a, a nonprofit organization and they'll have a mailing address at that nonprofit organization, right? And so one, one easy way is to sort of actually avoid identifying um, that particular element of anybody, of, of, of the fact that these are, when, when, we talk, when we talk about worker cooperatives, we talk about the racial demographics, we talk about the income demographics, we talk about the education demographics, but um, we don't really actually talk extensively and there is no, for instance, calculation of how many people are actually undocumented. That is only something you would know if you worked in that movement space. That is not something you need to actually talk about necessarily publicly in that way, precisely because it would make them vulnerable. And now there are other things to say about making vulnerable too. And I, I wish our other colleague Craig was here because there's other ways, for instance, community gardens are, uh, are, can be on squatted land. And so for you to identify openly community gardens that are on squatted land would also put them at risk. And so there is a lot that wherever you are doing this work, you have to sort of be in close conversation about what that community wants. And so in Philadelphia, all of those squatted gardens were not actually mapped. So this decision has to be made with that community in a way, right? So though all of those worker cooperatives that agreed to be identified, they were the ones that were identified. And the ones that didn't, weren't. Maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh. interrupt there, Miha, because we're out of time. But um, because this is such a wonderful and a rare opportunity for people to speak and get together, what I'm gonna do is stop the recording and I have to leave. But I'll leave the room open. So if if there are folks who want to discuss more, because I know it's such a wonderful, such a wonderful talk and, and brought up so many really important issues um, that I'm sure people want to follow up with. So I'll stop the yeah, recording. Maybe we could just take, maybe we could 